All right. Hey, everyone. I am thrilled to be welcoming back the amazing Dr. Judy Morgan, world-renowned veterinarian, author, podcast host, and overall an absolute superhero for pets <laughs> all over the world. Thank you so much for joining me, uh, Dr. Morgan. Happy to be here, as always. <laughs> uh, today, we're talking about naturally preventing pests like fleas and ticks. So. Hi. It's been warm outside here in Michigan, but it's been like a drier year, but we're still seeing ticks. And I know that there are fleas out there just waiting to grab a ride into the house. Now, uh, they're here. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 yep. them. <laughs> <laughs> now, there are a bunch of monthly pesticides that you can use to keep these pests at bay, right? These monthly topicals or pills. And I think at some point, most of us have used them, either the, the topical treatments or the pills that you grab at your local store or from your veterinarian. Now, What's the problem with the standard conventional options available on the market? Uh, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got all day. It's more, how much time do you have? <laughs> uh, so there are so many problems with the conventional products. Um, and the products, like I could literally rank them in the absolute worst down to the, if you're really desperate and need to use something, this is going to be your least toxic. Uh, but certainly we would rather not use the chemicals at all whenever mm -hmm. possible. So the isoxazoline group of drugs, um, sure. which is uh, Brevecto, Cordelio, Semperica, Nexgard, Revolution Plus, and combinations of those, because now they have like um, Semperica Trio and Nexgard Spectrum or something like th they just mm -hmm. keep adding more things in. Right. Um, so those are at the top of the list for me as being problematic. Uh, all of these chemical, well, most of the flea and tick uh, chemical preventatives, treatments, whatever they are, because uh, they don't really prevent, they're, they're more of a kill after the effect, after the fact. Uh, they're neurotoxins and they are supposed to only affect the nervous system of the fleas and the ticks, like the insects and the arthropods. Unfortunately, we have a lot of dogs and cats who develop seizures or tremors or ataxia, which is being wobbly on their feet. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, so there are literally hundreds of thousands of reports of adverse events from this particular class of drugs, both um, in Europe and in the US. I don't mm -hmm. track Canada and Australia. I don't know their reporting mechanisms, but I'm sure we've got problems there too. Um, so it, the problem, the, the neurotoxic effect of these was actually bad enough after they had been on the market for a few years that FDA did require all of the companies to put a statement on the packaging that says oh. uh, that, that we should not use these drugs in animals predisposed to seizures and potentially there could be a little problem there. Uh, but interestingly, even veterinary neurologists are saying, nope, they're fine to use, no problem. So if your pet starts having seizures and you see a neurologist, because I had a client who did this, they called me and they wanted a, um, a phone consultation to learn how to do something more natural for their pet and also how to detox their pet because their pet was having seizures and they had mm -hmm. been giving an isoxazoline product. And so when they went to the neurologist uh, and the dog was placed on all kinds of medication, anti-seizure medications, they said, well, we want to go with natural flea and tick products. Um, what do you recommend? Mm -hmm. And they literally said, all of those products that I just named were absolutely fine, but don't use Trifexis, which is a heartworm slash flea preventative because that one's linked to seizures. I mean, have, what rock are they hiding under that they didn't, they don't know. Like it even right. says it on the label. Like really it's right on the box. It's there. It's, yeah. it's right on the box. Like anybody can read this. Uh, unfortunately, most people don't. And unfortunately what happens a lot of times mm -hmm. is you'll have your pet at the veterinary office and they will feed your pet the chewable treat mm -hmm. and you don't even realize it. Right or you never see the packaging. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, well, we recommend this flea and tick preventative here. I can give it to them right now. Your dog or cat snatches it up, dogs mostly, snatches right. it up. And then you don't see the label. You don't get to read the warnings. You don't get, you know, the the issues. Yeah, the blind so, right. Yeah, so that's 
the my top of the list, like avoid these neurotoxins. Another one it's used more for heartworm preventative, but it's being used in combination with mm -hmm. these combo products that do fleas, ticks, and heartworms is moxidectin. Uh, mm -hmm. Moxidectin is a huge neurotoxin, lots of seizures, tremors. Um, so I never like to see that product used. That's what's in the injectable ProHeart. Um, it's moxidectin, which was taken off the market once and then brought back on the market without any changes in the drug content. Um, and then they pulled the dose and made it a 12 month injection instead of a three, a six month injection. Makes no sense, but that's the kind of things that we're doing. Right. The other side effects that we can see from some of these classes of chemicals, um, uh, internal hemorrhage. I just, there's, there's, quite a few um, social media groups now that say, you know, does blank kill dogs and cats and, you know, fill in the name of pick one of those chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, and I just saw one posted this morning. I, they had a flea problem. Uh, they, they're, they're a very holistic family, make all their own pet food. Uh, but they were having a flea problem that they just couldn't seem to get out from under. They went to their veterinarian with their five dogs and the veterinarian said, Oh, Here's the pill that I give my own dogs. It's the safest one on the market. In my mind, it's one of the most dangerous ones, probably the most dangerous one on the market. Gave it to their five dogs. And within 24 hours, one of the dogs was dead. It basically bled to death. Oh, my God. Um, so that's one of the things we can see, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, vomiting, diarrhea with blood. And when they took the dog into the emergency service, um, and this dog crashed fast, they said, probably not related. I don't know how you see something within a few hours of giving a drug and say it's not related. Right. So that is one of the reported side effects as well. So we have the neurologic problems. We have gastrointestinal problems, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, some of these chemicals, whether they're topical or oral, will cause horrible skin reactions. Mm. Um, so we can get almost an allergic type reaction with these, uh, the chemicals disrupt the gut microbiome, uh, the skin microbiome. So now we've got all kinds of digestive issues, allergies, itching, the, the whole, and shenan. if you disrupt the microbiome, some of that stuff could crop up later, right? Not, not yes. everything's going to happen right after you give it to them. Exactly. You, and yeah. that is part of the problem with a lot of these chemicals is we see the side effects mm -hmm. weeks to months later. And so then, of course, if, if a veterinarian is not willing to say that it's related to the drug when the reaction occurs within the first few hours, they certainly are not willing to say that it's related when it occurs days to weeks to months later. So um, it, it's a huge issue. And the other problem it, with a lot of these chemicals is your pet may be fine on them mm. for you know month after month, year after year until they're not. And then mm -hmm. when they decide they're going to have a problem, they have a huge problem. And that was actually even seen in the initial testing with some of these drugs mm -hmm. uh, where they had some animal <clears throat> animals that dropped dead after their third dose. And when they did the testing and, and looked at the levels in the blood, it's like, wow, this dog wasn't clearing the chemicals. The levels are really high. We don't know why they bioaccumulated them. Wow. Um and it was just kind of a one-off. And they're like, yeah, we don't have an explanation, but it, it was too small a percentage. It doesn't count. I'm sorry, it counts because you don't know how many yeah. animals, once it gets out on the market and millions of doses are sold, you don't know how many animals are going to do that. Yeah, and that and small percentage is still somebody's dog. That's somebody's family member. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so for the drug companies to say, well, you know, it's such a small percentage. If it's my dog, that's 100% for me, right. <laughs> you know, I like, and for this family that had five dogs and the one that they lost was a young, healthy dog, mm. really healthy right up until that moment. So, uh, really, and, and what the, the veterinary and pharmaceutical companies like to say is correlation does not equal causation. Sure. Okay. Well, when we have hundreds of thousands of adverse event reports, somebody needs to start correlating a few things. Mm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You've opened the door. Let's go in the room and let's look around. Let's see what's actually happening here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's part of the problem. Oh, your vet recommended next guard for your eight week old kitten with ear mites. Oh my gosh, please don't. There are so many natural ways to treat that. Holy cow. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's become so easy um, to just take the convenient road. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what pet parent doesn't, 
say, oh, I just have to give that little chewable every three months and I never have to worry about my dog getting fleas or ticks. Like, Convenience? that sounds Fine like... Up. Yeah. It sounds like a dream come true. I mean, yeah. come on. I got a lot. Of, I've got 11 cats and five dogs. Wow. <laughs> convenience. It's not going to happen at my house. Yeah. Um, so there's there's the other problem that we have with a lot of the topical chemical, actually even the oral chemicals. So there was this great study mm -hmm. where they took um, three dogs. One had been given a, an oral. I think it was it was either Brevector or Nexgar, but one had been given an oral treatment. One had been given a topical Fipronil treatment and one had been given nothing. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, tested the hair of all the dogs before they started. And so the one that had nothing had no chemicals in the hair, the one that had Fipronil obviously had Fipronil and the one with the oral product also had that chemical in their hair. Then they took the dogs and they put them in a little swimming pool with water in it and let the dogs kind of play in there uh, for just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. After that, when they tested the hair of all the dogs, all three dogs had all the chemicals, even wow. the dog that had never been treated. So your dog gets an oral chemical or a topical chemical. He's shedding that in the environment. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have children? <laughs> do you hug your dog? Do you swim with your dog? Do you sleep with your dog? Do you want these chemicals? Um, and there was a, a great study where they tested waterways in Europe and mm -hmm. found that something like 98% of them ha have fipronil in them at levels that are considered dangerous. Right. Um, they tested the hair of children in France. Something It was over 95% of the children have oh these flea and tick chemicals in their hair. So it's, it's contaminating our waterways. And guess what? A lot of these products are dangerous to marine life. Hmm. What happens when we kill off all the algae or we kill off all the fish or we kill off all the mosquitoes? Right. So, uh, uh, one of the um, isoxazoline drugs is being used to treat chickens. It's being mm -hmm. fed to chickens for um, chicken mites. Uh, so that's in the meat, <laughs> folks. <Right. laughs> You know, if they're shedding it out of their bodies, they've also got it in the meat. Um, and they actually, there was a proposal a few years ago uh, against, I, I really, this is a long-winded answer. I'm really sorry. Uh, there, there, was a, there was a proposal a few years ago um, to treat people and prevent malaria. Mm -hmm. And so malaria is spread by mosquitoes. And their thinking was if they took a population of people in a high malaria area and 25% of the people ate this isoxazoline, mm -hmm. uh, the mosquitoes that bit them would die and it would kill off enough of the mosquito population that it would stop the spread of malaria. Well, that's amazing. Well, kill off all the mosquitoes. What are our birds eating? Yeah, kill off all the birds. What happens? You know, the, it's an important part of a, a fragile ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, and you know, don't we mess with other nature. Ecosystems at just about every level, but we rely on them. We are a huge part of these ecosystems. Yep. You know, we, I think a, as humans, we've kind of removed ourselves from the ecosystem in a way in our minds. You go yep. to the grocery store and you get food. It doesn't come from the ecosystem. It doesn't rely on insects. It doesn't rely on marine life. It comes from the grocery store, but exactly. And you and I were talking about down. gardening before we yeah. went live. Mm -hmm. And one of my problems with why my garden doesn't grow, um, and we don't use any chemicals, but we live on what used to be farmland. It was hay fields. I have no idea what was used there before. Mm -hmm. uh, we have no pollinators. Mm -hmm. Last year we had zero pollinators. Uh, the year before wow. our neighbors had beehives and we had mm -hmm. plenty of pollinators. Last year, their beehives were not, if you don't, I, I don't know the if they bees, all died. I don't have no idea there. what happened, but yeah. we had no pollinators. Wow. So we got zero fruits and vegetables oh, on our no. plants because no pollinators. This and year, one of the my things you write about, yeah, one of the things you write about in, in your book, um, I thought this was really shocking. Um, it, one medium sized dog who is treated with a mitocloprid, that's enough pesticide to kill 60 million bees. And now they're shedding that into the environment. They're shedding that into the waterways. 
um, they just become this walking bastion of death. You know, yeah. it's, it's a little scary. We kind of need scary. this stuff. As the pesticides get into the soil as well, there's actually some interesting research that it can be creating uh, or working toward creating some antibiotic resistant bacteria. So it's just like we're, we're just engineering this very difficult future for ourselves. Well, that's why we're making engineered foods mm -hmm. that we can grow in a lab right. because it's going to be impossible to grow them any other way. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to eat those either, but you know. <laughs> We're going to have to figure out a way to grow our own food somehow. It's uh, It'll be a challenge. It won't be as easy as it was uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago, just to put plants out and let them do their thing. I know. Yep. Like I, I I struggle as a gardener. I, I kind of stink at it. Maybe I need to go back and move everything back into the greenhouse. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so so we're, we're leaning toward these these very harsh chemicals to, to prevent these pests on our pets. Um. <clears throat> yeah. So, so what is the threat from these pests though? I mean, is this risk that we're taking greater than the risk of allowing these pests onto our pets maybe? Well, so we'll look at ticks. Yeah. People freak out about ticks. Oh my gosh, it's going to get Lyme disease. It's going to die. Everyone has Lyme disease. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't. Uh, <laughs> the, the percentage of dogs that actually get Lyme disease, um, from ticks is, I, I, well, they get them from ticks, but the percentage of ticks, of dogs bitten by ticks that get mm -hmm. Lyme disease, I'll get it right sooner or later, uh, is actually very small. Mm -hmm. um, and then the percentage of dogs who actually develop life-threatening disease when they are bitten by a Lyme positive tick is like 1%. Wow. It is a really low percent. Mm -hmm. um, Lyme disease is treatable. All the tick-borne diseases are treatable. You just have to see the symptoms and you need to be on top of things. And yes, you do want to keep ticks off your 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 pets. It does um, uh, It does require them to be attached for a certain amount of time to transmit some of these things as that well. That is up right? for debate. Okay. Uh, it used to be um, 24 to 48 hours was what mm -hmm. was thought. Uh, there are newer studies saying that literally within an hour, it, <laughs> it can be transmitted. So... I don't know. I don't hear that. The, yeah, I'm a little on the fence on that one. Okay. Uh, but the problem with a lot of these chemicals, they're not repelling. Your pet mm -hmm. has to get bitten by the flea or the tick in in order for the chemical to kill them. Right. Um, <clears throat> so if they're if they have to get bitten anyway, uh, and so for instance, my mother for many years put a topical on her dog every mm -hmm. single month. Uh, back then it was frontline for fleas and ticks. And so when I got into the more holistic stuff and I was really changing how I was doing things, one day I said to her, mom, why do you keep putting the front line on your dog? I mean, you know, I'm more holistic now. We don't recommend this stuff and I don't use anything on my dogs. Why are you putting this on your dog every month? Mm -hmm. I said, have you ever seen a flea or a tick on your dog? And she said, no, and I don't want to. And my, the light bulb went off over my head and I went, you think this stuff repels them. Hey, guess what, mom? It doesn't repel them. So you don't see fleas and ticks on your dog. It means you don't have fleas and ticks. Your dog is in a flea and tick-free environment. So why are we using a harmful, potentially cancer-causing chemical that's harming the environment as well as the dog and all the people that are petting, loving, sleeping with whatever, the dog? Right. Uh, and she went, oh. <laughs> and so that's a common misconception that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. They think when they put these chemicals on or feed them, mm -hmm. it will repel them. Creates a shield. Not. Right. It, yeah. There, there, there is no cone of silence around your dog. Um, so, uh, you know, and I, I have a three-year-old granddaughter. I don't want my granddaughter petting them, hugging them, sleeping with them, snuggling them and absorbing those chemicals. Like, ew. Right. Um, like, I don't want me to get it, but I certainly don't want the three-year-old because, you know, that's a bigger problem. And the other thing is if you treat one animal in your house, you're going to find that chemical on all of your animals, mm -hmm. just like the dogs in the pool. Yeah. And you better believe that's on you as well. I mean, you're an animal in the same house. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Wow. That is that, that pool story was stunning to me. That's yeah. <laughs> a little scary, a little terrifying. <laughs> it's very terrifying. So yeah. it, it, uh, frankly, do we want to swim in the waterways of Europe that are all, <laughs> all filled with fipronil? <laughs> right. Well, have we and looked I'm sure at the same waterways? thing is here. Yeah. I, you know, I'm sure it's, it's like that in many countries, right. uh, but you know, when we start looking and testing, it's sort of like when you start testing for glyphosate, you go, oh, poo. Oops. That's problem. <laughs> we should have done this before. Yeah. So um, so walk me through what natural prevention looks like. 
Well, natural prevention actually does look like repelling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. that's a good thing. Um, so the problem with natural prevention, you, you can't give a pill once every three months and have it's natural. Kind of like going for a walk. You got to put that, that bug spray on when you know you're going to be in an area. You, you have to use daily treatments. Mm -hmm. um, so, however, with my own animals, I don't have to use daily treatment 90% of the year mm -hmm. because we just don't have an issue. Um, about this time of year, I'm in North Carolina, about this time of year is when the fleas like to show up. Mm. So my daughter just texted me yesterday and said, oh, my cat's a fleas. And uh, so I found some fleas on my dogs and I'm like, eh, poop. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. uh, so most of the time I don't have to do anything. And mm -hmm. the reason I don't have to do anything is because my dogs do not go in the woods. My dogs are in a fenced yard with grass that's mown short. Mm -hmm. We only have one flower bed in that area that they can even get near that has mulch in it. Fleas and ticks don't like hot sunny, barren areas. Like it's just not hospitable for them. Right. Um, it's a little more hospitable this year because we've had so much rain. So the humidity is very, very flea and tick friendly. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to keep your pets at all, if at all possible in an area where they're not going into tall grasses, they're not going into underbrush, they're not going in the woods, they're not going where there's a lot of uh, mulch and leaf litter, because mm. that's where these things like to hang out. Mm. Now, if I take my dogs for a walk through the wooded area of our property, I'd better put something on them or we are going to come home with some, some ticks. Wow. Um, so you can use essential oils that repel really well. There's a ton of different products on the market now. Make sure that if you're using essential oils, you're using ones that are made specifically for use on pets because our pets are very sensitive to essential oils. Um, they're very sensitive to toxic uh, heavy metals and that sort of thing in, in products that are not clean. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the, uh, the easiest ones to use if you want to just get a pet safe product is rose geranium oil one dot of that between the shoulder blades one dot of that on the butt and it usually does a really good job wow uh, that's by it, just itself. Not, yeah yeah because with and that's the full undiluted essential oil most right. essential oils you're going to have to dilute them down a lot mm -hmm. um so if you want to make your own, there are recipes. We actually have some recipes on our site, um, mm. but there's plenty of those out there. So you can make your own. Um, I remember 20 years ago, again, before I was really into the holistic stuff, we used to make uh, our own fly spray for our horses and we would use uh, white vinegar, water, and Avon Skin So Soft, which always smelled so good and made their coats really soft. But it was right. the best mosquito repellent and fly repellent in the world. Um, now I use essential oil sprays for my horses and my donkeys. Um, so you can use sprays, but the sprays you're going to, if you're, if you're going to go for a walk in the woods today, spray them. If you're going to go for a walk in the woods tomorrow, spray them again before you go. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't want your animal to have all that on them, you could spray a bandana, put that on them. Uh, most ticks that we pick up tend to be around the head area because they're sticking their face in the bushes sniffing along mm. in the leaves and the litter yeah, okay. um so sometimes a you know a nice uh bandana with a lot of that on it um is a good repellent as well mm -hmm. um for our barn cats trying to spray nine barn cats would be pretty difficult now don't think they'd let me do it yeah. um we use a powder which is diatomaceous earth yarrow mm -hmm. and neem um, and you wow. only need a little tiny bit. So that makes it really easy for my barn cats who some of them are a little like, yeah, I don't know if I want you near me. Uh, so basically we put it in the palm of our hand and then pet the cat. <laughs> and easy we'll do that about, right. Yeah. So we do that about once a week. Okay. Um, you can also feed garlic. We mm -hmm. do have doses for garlic on the website. Um, and also in the book, uh, mm -hmm. cats are a little more sensitive to garlic. So you're going to use a lower dose for the kitty cats. Um, but for dogs. So when I found a few fleas last week, I was like, all right, everybody's back on garlic. So everybody in the house, all the dogs, they're getting their garlic once a day. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's tons of different things that we can use. And then, uh, the big thing that people don't understand is that only 5% of the life cycle of fleas is spent on the pet. The other 95% in your house, 
in your yard, maybe in your car. Yeah. Um, fighting fleas don't just target the animal. They're all not, in the environment. Yeah. Do not. And that's, that's where we get in so much trouble. It's like, oh, I'm just going to give them this pill from the vet. And it's like, yeah, but you didn't do anything for the environment. Right. And I have zero carpet in my house mm -hmm. because I don't want fleas hanging out in my house. Yeah. I have zero carpet. You have a lot uh, of animals. So. <laughs> and we have a lot of animals. So, you know, when they have little animal accidents in the house, which is oh, sure. frequent, um, <laughs> <laughs> then it makes cleanup much easier. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing. You really have to treat the environment. So you can use uh, diatomaceous earth in your house. Like you can sprinkle that in your carpets. Don't forget like down in the sofa crevices. Mm. Um, so we had a flea problem at our house in New Jersey before we moved. Gwen, my daughter, had come to visit for Thanksgiving and brought her brand new little eight-week-old kitten that she had just adopted and he was covered with fleas. Yeah. And so she left my house with my 10 animals 15, whatever I had at the time. That is not how that happened. Yes, that is how that happened. She's arguing with me. So, um, it was unrelated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally unrelated to the kitten with fleas. Uh, but I, I was having so much trouble. So I'm, you know, using my essential oil shampoos on everybody. I'm doing everything I can yeah. and vacuuming, washing all the bedding, vacuuming down in the sofa crevices. And, all, and mm -hmm. I just, they just kept coming back and coming back and coming oh, back. Man. Finally, our cleaning person was there and I said, Patty, you're going to help me today. We are going to move every piece of furniture in this house and we are going to clean like nobody's business because there's they're, they're here somewhere and mm -hmm. I just haven't found that place yet. Right. One of the Lazy Boy recliners, when we actually flipped it up to get under the little base, mm -hmm. there was this huge pile of hair with fleas hopping all over the place. And I'm like, that's where you guys have been hiding. Right. Once we got rid of Disneyland. that. Yeah. yeah. It was flea Disneyland. And once yeah. it, it was the flea circus. And once we got rid of that, the problem disappeared. It was like, okay, great. I got one more washing to do of all the bedding. I got one more essential oil spray on all the animals or bath, whatever. Right. We got rid of that. And that solved the problem. So the environment is so critical and figuring out where are they coming from? Um, when we used to set off flea bombs in the house all the time, um, before we ha had other ways of doing these things, mm -hmm. uh, I would have people set off flea bombs and treat their animals and they'd still have fleas. Yes. And what we found crawl space, the crawl space or the mm -hmm. basement. If you have an old house with a dirt floor basement or a crawl space under your house, huge area where they, cause it's moist and humid under there. Um, and oh my gosh, they will go yeah. crazy. So you have to really think about where could they be hiding? What area have I not treated? Mm -hmm. So for your yard or like if you have a dirt floor basement, that sort of thing, you can spray nematodes, which mm -hmm. are little tiny guys, uh, that basically, um, attack the flea eggs and larvae. So the immature stages of the fleas and ticks, uh, so that you don't develop adult fleas and ticks. Um, mm -hmm. so my daughter has sprayed her yard with the nematodes. Okay. Do they last or is that something you have to repeat when you have an issue again? They last they pretty long. The Gwen, do you remember what it said? Like spray monthly? The nematodes? Yeah. No, it's like once, once or twice a year. Once or twice a year, she says. Okay, for sure. So it lasts pretty well. So I have clients in Florida who were having just all kinds of flea issues. They finally did nematodes and solved their problem. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And that, it's a very natural way to approach it too. I mean, that's uh, a yeah. nematodes are gardener's friend. Yeah. That's a, it's a natural predator. So, yeah. Um, so you hit one point and I, I think you made it very well, but I, I would just love to revisit it when you're doing these natural preventions, is this something you have to keep up all year? I know with a lot of topical stuff, your vet will say, oh, just keep it, keep it going all year long. Uh, so no, you, no. You, you do it when there's pressure, right? When there's pressure. You do it when there's pressure. So like in my family, I do nothing with my animals until I see an issue. Mm. And then when I see an issue, it's like, oh, I'm going to start powdering barn cats. I'm going to start using essential oils or bathing um, with, with the dogs. I tend to bathe them with the essential oil shampoos. It's mm -hmm. just the easiest way to treat them. Um, right. And then I start vacuuming a lot more <laughs> <laughs> and trying to find where they're hiding. And mm -hmm. I, again, this stinking lazy boy chair, I just flipped one up yesterday and I'm like, again, again, you know, like you, you gotta, you gotta think about where are they hiding? And there are some pieces of furniture that are hard to move. Mm -hmm. piano 
a little hard to move, but you've got to get all those areas because just think it's 95% is in the environment. You've got it. So that's the eggs, the larvae. You, you got to get rid of them. One female right. flea can lay 2000 eggs in about a week. Jeez. So your, your itchy dog people, is just the symptom. Yeah, your itchy dog is just the symptom telling you that you have an environmental problem. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Um, so where can we learn more about <laughs> it? I mean, there's the, more to learn about fleas and ticks, but I know there's so many other parasites that potentially threaten our dogs and cats. So where can people learn more about natural approaches to this rather than using these <laughs> monthly... So we have a couple of resources. Uh, we have uh, tons of these kinds of conversations that we've done on social media. We also have a um, parasite ebook download on fleas, ticks, and heartworms and natural wow. prevention. So that is available on our website. And then my latest book, Raising Naturally Healthy Pets, which is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, that one, uh, mm -hmm. and on our website um, that has the, the parasite chapter is really long. The two longest chapters in that book are vaccines and parasite prevention, uh, because we need to do better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to stop using so many chemicals. And right. if we, you know, can allow our pets immune system to be healthy by feeding them a good diet, reducing the vaccines, reducing the chemicals, let them have a healthy microbiome so that their immune system is healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, the chances of them having a heavy infestation really slim really mm. like even when i get fleas at my house it's like a couple the, yeah. they don't get infested because they're healthy animals um and so that's what we find so with intestinal parasites heartworms mm. uh external parasites you're not going to have issues uh, that's why we see intestinal parasites ear mites those sorts of things so often in the very young in the kittens and in the puppies because their immune system isn't working yet once their right. immune system works, it's like, oh, I don't have to worry about those worms anymore. Right. Yeah. And that's so interesting. And you do see the same thing in the plant world as well, where the plants that are healthier are going to be much more resistant to pests, much more resistant to disease. Yep. Um, so it's just interesting how plants and animals are so connected in so many ways. <laughs> They're living beings. <laughs> that's true. We're all Absolutely. connected. Yeah. Kind of all built off the same blueprints in a lot of ways. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be honest, I, for years and years and years and years, I focused so heavily on nutrition, I almost had blinders to the other things that go into keeping an animal healthy. <laughs> um, and I, I know you talked about, you know, basically reducing your chemical exposure, both vaccines and these pesticides. But besides good food and, you know, reducing exposure to the two things we just mentioned, are there other big pillars that I'm missing, that I'm forgetting about? That, uh, that we should think about. Yeah, mental and emotional well-being mm -hmm. for our animals. Um, you know, we, we think, particularly of cats, we're like, meh, they don't really need to interact. They're these, you know, solitary beings. Yeah. Uh, if your cat is in an apartment by himself all day it, with no interaction and you're at work, that really stinks for the cat. Um, yeah. While they are a little more solitary, they need vertical spaces, uh, they need interaction, they need to play and hunt and find prey just like they would outside. Mm -hmm. um, my outdoor cats are the healthiest cats I've ever had because they're on raw diets, they are hunting, they're doing cat things. Um, they're, they're in a very safe environment. We don't live near a main road or anything. So, and we have 23 acres for them to play on. Wow. Um, so that, that makes a huge difference. I understand that most people cannot allow their cats outside. I get it. Um, wow. but these are the leanest, meanest, best looking, mm -hmm. healthiest cats, uh, versus my two indoor cats who look like poo. Uh, they, they have interaction, but it's just not the same. They're not right. getting to hunt and pounce and climb things and, and do what they need have, to do. Yeah. I have to uh, make possible life or death decisions sometimes as well. Yes. You know, can and, I make this jump? Can I jump on that animal? <laughs> right. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so for our dogs, um, you know, we see boredom. We see that I just wrote, uh, an article for people magazine, uh, about filling your dog's emotional cup mm -hmm. and also about boredom in dogs. And a lot of the behavior, like we, 
we expect our pets to live in our world and we expect them to not do the things they would do in their world. Mm -hmm. So we don't like it when a dog digs. Well, that's a natural thing for them to do. We don't yeah. like it when a dog chews. That's a natural thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. So we are frustrating them all the time by ask, asking them to live by our rules. You've mm -hmm. got to give them an emotional outlet. Um, so whether that's doing training or playtime, going to go on safaris, going, taking walks, like we'll pop our dogs in the car and take them to different parks, um, giving mm -hmm. them that, I mean, our dogs have plenty of things. They can, you know, bark and run at chickens and donkeys and horses and, you know, all kinds of things to entertain them. Right. Um, but that's really important, that emotional and mental component that we just don't think about. Yeah. Being cared for really well, but not leading a fulfilling life. Right. It's just, it, it's not what you want for your animals. It wouldn't be well, what it, you want for yourself, your parents, your kids. It leads anything, to disease. You know? uh, yeah. That, that if we, particularly the working breeds, mm -hmm. uh, the, the working dog breeds, right? their, their mental game is to have a job. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a consultation with somebody yesterday and she had this dog that was, all of its symptoms were really coming from emotional issues that mm -hmm. it was sort of bottling up and then it would, mm -hmm. you know, come out as disease. Um, and I said, you gotta find a job for that dog. That dog right. needs a job. Yeah. And so sometimes we finally came up with, uh, she, the woman works out a lot in her home gym and the dog lays in the corner while she's working out. And I said, could you just tell your dog the job is to even like, the dog is there to keep you company because you need companionship because you can't go to the gym with your friends anymore. Mm -hmm. And now you need a companion. Give your dog that job, like any job, right. <laughs> just give them a job. <laughs> right. Absolutely. It's not fulfilling just to exist. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes that's what we ask of our pets. No, be quiet. Go lay down, go lay yeah. down, go lay down. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, and I find that when I do that with my dogs, like if I'm really busy, I'm really focused. And you know, eight hours later, I'm like coming up for air and go, Oh gosh, <laughs> you guys have been laying there for eight hours. Right. I am sorry, guys. Let's go do something for you. Right. Exactly. Because the, the behaviors that come out of mm -hmm. not them not doing anything for eight hours, not so good. <laughs> right. It would be the same for me. I mean, if you just sit down in there, be quiet, you can't have a book, you can't have anything to watch, just sit down and right. be quiet. Yeah. Oh yeah, I would go nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, that's actually one of the reasons we craft, we, we have a, uh, one of our webinars is called Enrichment. And it's all about viewing the world from your dog or cat's eyes and, and from their natural behaviors, you know, and really feeding those instinctive natural behaviors and trying to work that more into your life and theirs. So I'm so glad you mentioned that. That's something I've been working to do better with my own dogs. It, a lot of times I'll think like, oh, they have tons of space. They have chickens. You know, <laughs> we, we've got a very interesting yard with lots of different zones to it. You know, oh, they're fine. They spend a lot of time outside guarding and patrolling, but they do need more. Yeah. So. Yep. They need that. They need that social interaction. We're sort of mm -hmm. their pack leader. Um, right. You know, we are, we are part of their social group and mm -hmm. they want to interact with us as part of that social group. So. Right. so I understand on your end that this week you're focusing on gut health, right? Yes. That, yes. So you're doing lots of great conversations, talking about the microbiome and stuff. Yep. Very yeah, cool. This afternoon, we're going to talk about uh, cancer related to gut health. Mm -hmm. Um. I can't even remember what I'm doing. Oh, tomorrow um, it's Roxanne Stone from Solutions Pet Food. Okay. I can't remember what we're talking about, but anyway, three o'clock each day, uh, Eastern time. Uh, we're doing cool. some really fun interviews this week. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I love anything to do with gut or microbiome or any of that stuff. I've got a total fascination with the microbial world. I think when I was a kid, I think two years in a row uh, for science fair projects, I had to do science fair projects every year. That was non-negotiable. Um, I think I did microbes like two years in a row. I was like growing <laughs> mold in my basement. Oh, yeah. yeah, total nerd. It's fine. <laughs> um, 
So we did mention your book several times. And for those of you guys who are watching who haven't checked this out yet, again, I call it the instruction manual for dogs because it really has so much- Dogs and cats, the, actually. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry about that. For dogs and cats, because <laughs> it really has so many of the different facets that you don't necessarily think of, even if you've been in the industry for years like I have. You know, if you just get very nutritionally focused or in a box, this really helps round things out. Um, and I was told, um, I, I put a little banner up just so you guys know, um, I'm gonna give away a couple bags of protein bites in just a second. But I was told that um, we could offer 10% off of your new book, Raising Naturally Healthy Pets. On our website, um, yes. On your website, absolutely. And I think there's a coupon code for that, which is Steve's 10. Um, I'm gonna pop that in the comments right now. No explanation because this is for those of you who are watching live. Um, Phyllis asked uh, where she can learn more about our episodes this week. They're on all of our social media, YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, under drjudymorgan.com. Uh, so what's our, our Instagram is Dr. Judy Morgan. Our YouTube is Everything at, Dr. Judy at Dr. Judy Morgan. Okay. Thank you. Shows you what I know. I'm a talking head. I show up. <laughs> I, show I don't up, have I to do. work anything. <laughs> I do what they tell me to do. <laughs> All right, guys. So as promised, uh, let's give out a few bags of protein bites. And then I know you have a very busy day of spreading more awesome information. So as much as I would love to keep you here just talking to us and, and teaching me so much. Um, I do have to let you go, I think. All right, Elizabeth Jane Underwood. Congratulations. That is a beautiful picture of your dog. That looks like my first dog, Zola. Um, she didn't have the white detail underneath, but oh man, she was such a cool dog. All right, congratulations, Elizabeth. And if you would reach out to us, send us a message on Facebook. We'll take your name and um, address and get a bag of protein bites right out to you. And I'm gonna do one more. I don't know if I'm supposed to or not, but I love hitting that button, so. <laughs> if we're up to me, I, that would be the whole presentation. We would come on here and I would just hit that button again and again. All right, Nancy King, congratulations. Awesome. See, so yeah, again, reach out to us on Facebook, send us a message. Um, uh, don't send it over to Judy Morgan's people. Send it over to um, <laughs> Steve's Real Food because they'll be like, I don't know what you're talking about. We're not sending out any protein bites. So send it over to us and uh, we'll get those sent right out. Although there. we do have protein bites too. You do, absolutely, which is so cool that you picked those up. And we had a great conversation them. about those last time. I actually learned some about our protein bites from you, which was a ton of fun. <laughs> and again, that's why I love talking to you whenever we get the chance. Um. But I want to thank you so much for coming on. It was a lot of fun talking today. For I, I mentioned this before that for years, you know, years ago, I used the conventional over-the-counter flea and tick treatments. And so I love learning more and more about how to better take care of my pets. And it turns out my kids and myself. Exactly. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for sharing this information and this knowledge. And um, I hope to talk to you again before too long. Thank you. And thanks for everyone who joined us, everyone who watched, and everyone who uh, tossed a comment in there. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Go give your dogs a belly rub, and we'll see you next time. And play with your cats. Yes. Don't forget <laughs> the cats.